Good evening, everybody. Ladies and gentlemen, the Summer School of the University of Vienna has a long-standing history of bringing together people from all over the world. Founded in the aftermath of World War II and after the horror of the National Socialist regime, the Sommerhochschule has always been a peace project. The idea of our institution was to have an international student encounter to allow for intercultural exchange and to foster cultural and scientific ties. Sommerhochschule stands for mixing students and scholars from various disciplines and for creating an intellectually stimulating environment for learning and academic debate. Since 2008, we used unique premises of this campus and the fascinating atmosphere for our summer discourse of Wirtschaft, Recht und Kultur. The topics which we treat at this summer discourse are the great challenges our societies are facing today. Many of them are recurrent themes, climate change, international conflicts endangering peace and stability, advantages and disadvantages of globalization and free trade, the financial crisis, the demographic challenges and the migration flows in Europe. An overall theme has always been the role science and scholarship may play in coping with the many crises of our time. When we came up with this year's topic, rebuilding social cohesion and stability, we optimistically thought that the two years of pandemic might be over <coughs> by now. We now know that this is not true and that besides that, we face numerous additional catastrophes for the world order as the war against Ukraine and the accompanying energy crisis and record inflation. The tension is high and our societies seem more fractured than ever. One hope, however, is the power of reflection and dialogue. The belief that rational analysis and human empathy may help to overcome even the worst problems and that thus we might build up resilience and regain stability. In order to address the issues of social cohesion and the dangers we face today, we can rely in the summer discourse on a number of excellent experts and renowned scholars. I'm very proud of all the speakers and participants who accepted our invitation to contribute to this year's summer discourse. And I particularly would like to thank those who helped me to design this year's program. A big thank you to my personal think tank, which comprises friends like Nikolaus Forgo, Silvia Kritzinger, Helmut and Christine Hanusch Linzer, Paul Frey and Michael Stampfer. An equally big thanks to all our speakers and to those who support us financially. I would like to thank most warmly Dr. Roland Gerlach, Dr. Norbert Marshall, the Wiener Wissenschafts- und Technologiefonds, the Kurhotel Strobel, and the Kunsthistorisches Museum for their support. With their generous aid, we will be able to enjoy a wonderful chamber concert tomorrow night at the church in Strobel, and to admire Bruegel's painting here on Friday in the afternoon. But now it's my great pleasure to introduce to you tonight's keynote speaker, Professor Bernhard Kittel. <coughs> Bernhard Kittel is Austrian, but he spent parts of his youth and uh, young adulthood in Switzerland and the Netherlands. He then came back to Austria in order to study political science at the University of Vienna, where he earned a doctorate in 1994. He also studied uh, social science data analysis at the University of Essex and then pursued very successfully an academic career. He was a fellow 
at the Max Planck Institute in Cologne. He then was junior professor at the University of Bremen, junior professor at the University of Amsterdam, and then, then had his uh, first appointment as a full professor at the University of Oldenburg, where he also was even founding dean, I think, of the social science faculty. Ten years ago, he came back to the University of Vienna, but not at the Department of Political Science, but uh, at the Department of Economic Sociology, as you can see. Uh, and he, he now teaches uh, social science methods there, and he's also a member of the Austrian Corona Panel Project, and therefore got a lot of insight about the social consequences of the pandemic, and hence also the title of uh, his uh, lecture tonight, his keynote tonight, A Fractured Society, a Social Science Perspective. Thank you, Bernhard, for accepting our invitation. Well, uh, thank you very much for your kind words and your introduction. Uh, thank you also very much for the invitation to give this uh, lecture. It's a very honoring uh, thing for me. Um, fractured society. This title um, was invented probably by the uh, organizing team. And uh, they told me the title after I had uh, accepted the invitation. <laughs> So the challenge of the last couple of uh, weeks, month, was uh, to fulfill the promise that um, lies in the title. Um, so I have to speak about fractures in society or about a society that is fractured and I have to give a social science perspective. And I like the word science in the title because that is the claim, and that's the claim that we make in the Austrian Corona Panel Project, that here we are not just talking, telling narratives, but that we are doing science based on hard numbers. Um, here uh, in the, the picture, let me say a few words about this picture. Um, it has been uh, made by Luisa Puyu, uh, whom I asked to simply go through the city of Vienna and to make pictures of what happened to uh, people, to society, uh, due to the pandemic. It was a cold day in March, and um, it was during the period when uh, wearing masks was mandatory in public pl places. Now, what I like about this picture is that it shows the singularization that happened due to the pandemic. You see people alone, you see people in very small groups, and you can also see, if you look very uh, precisely, that it shows the tension that has grown in society. If you look at these three people, they don't wear masks. So here, some sense of opposition during a time when mask wearing was mandatory more or less everywhere. Now the question is, what is fractured society? I mean, if we look into the social science literature, we uh, get, uh, or we find many, many different terms that uh, represent a society that has all kinds of divisions. Divided society as a title has been an important title some, uh, some years back. Um, so everything you can uh, come up with, uh, terms that represent division, have been connected with society. Now, I did a literature search on fractured society and uh, as a start for preparing for this lecture. And what I found was lots and lots of uh, papers and books about societies like Somalia, Afghanistan, um, about countries that are really fractured, yeah, where um, no homogeneity uh, exists. Then, if we move on, the term starts to pop up in connection with the United States. And it is only very recently, a couple of uh, years ago, that, it, uh, that I find references that speak about the general weird countries, 
Western educated, industrialized, rich, democratic countries, realizing that actually that's the weird part. Countries that are more or less homogeneous are a minority of countries. So this term fractured societies, if you use it for, for example, European countries, means that something very serious is going on, that those weird countries where everything seems to happen very smoothly, cohesive societies, are on the road to a less benign state. So, um, in some sense, in this title, embodied is a horror scenario that all those processes of civilization that uh, European countries have developed in horrific uh, experiences. Yeah, if, we start, if we go through the last 2,000 years of civilization, there have been quite a few moments when everything went burst. So are we going back to that Hobbesian state of nature? Everything falling apart? Well, my conclusion will be, it's not that bad. <laughs> to take that as a beginning. But, so let's look into, um, no. no, we don't, because the system doesn't respond. So this works again, but this doesn't work. So we need manual. I will spend a few minutes talking about two uh, books that have uh, that term fractured societies with reference to European countries in their title. It's a book by the uh, historian Paul Kennedy and, by the, uh, and a second book by the, uh, well this is not a book, this is a short version in a, uh, in a paper, uh, Graham Scambler who is a health sociologist. Now both refer to the most recent developments in the organization of uh, capitalism, which they term, so Scambler speaks about financial capitalism, Kennedy of vampire uh, capitalism. So the kind of uh, processes that we have been experiencing over the last 20 to 30 years, that is what they think of. And uh, to quote Paul Kennedy, he argues that uh, current economic practices with the focus on financialization, on uh, uh, neglect of the, uh, between uh, quotation marks, real economy, um, actually work against the uh, development of uh, economic processes. So that's one challenge that he identifies. Uh, a second uh, uh, challenge is uh, far to be found in technological advances. Well, this is actually something that has happened over the whole course of industrialization, of replacing manual work by uh, uh, work by machines. Now, the new element is that this, this does not only affect blue color jobs, it also affects white collar jobs. And the fear that is expressed is that this time uh, jobs will not, that uh, jobs that are lost will not be replaced twice or thrice uh, by new jobs, new developments, which has been the case in most technological advances. They did not lead to less work, but to more work. Yeah? Now the fear is that this time everything is different. Um, a third aspect, individualization and lifestyle cultures dissolve social coherence. Well, you can connect that with um, a decline in commonality of what we're doing. Think of uh, your, for most of your parents, at least my parents, um, who all watch the same television program at night. And the next day they could talk about the same television program. Now everybody is watching different 
select yourself uh, channels. And so there's nothing to talk about on the next day because everybody has seen some different movies. Yeah? So um, uh, that process um, of more choice, more individual freedom, if you li like, goes hand in hand with less possibilities to socialize. Well, you remember that uh, Putnam thesis uh, who blamed television for uh, not being, uh, uh, for uh, bowling alone, that's the title of his famous book. Uh, bowling alone is the most stupid thing you can do. Bowling is something you sit and you drink and everybody alternatively, uh, alt alternates in um, throwing a ball. And, but that's not about, uh, it's not the sport, it's the, the social gathering that's important. And uh, as a fourth element, um, uh, environmental risk has an overarching risk looming large over uh, current society. So that's Paul Kennedy. Once more, a technological failure. Um, so let me move on uh, by using my hands. Doesn't work either. So now we will need help again. Yeah, does it work again? So let's move to uh, Graham Scambler. He brings in another element, um, a more political perspective, if, if you like, that uh, political decisions tend to be more and more, that's Graham uh, Scambler's thesis, uh, dominated by interests of uh, capitalist monopolies like the big internet firms or uh, large uh, enterprises. Um, a second element that has become uh, more pronounced in the last 20 to 30 years is that um, groups that are marginalized in society, uh, they are groups um, that are uh, confronted with the problem of uh, shame of their uh, state. And now on top of that shame, which is an individual feeling, they are blamed by politics. I just remember the policies of uh, the, um, uh, the, the, the turquoise blue uh, government in 2017-18. Um, the third element is that um, issues of identity started to dominate uh, problems of class uh, divisions and that identity politics sharpens insider-outsider problematic. So your identity becomes a criterion of inclusion or exclusion. Yeah, we can see that uh, with respect to migrants, but we can also see that on the gender divide, for example. And further, this accumulates in uh, a challenge at the political level that uh, traditional parties are more and more challenged by uh, populist parties with questionable programs um, who uh, focus on gathering uh, or on maximizing the number of votes that they get. Uh, so this picture is a very doom picture. Uh, and what these people and uh, Kennedy and Scambler are just examples of that, then argue is all these processes that we have summarized here lead to a fractured society. There is environmental threat continually, but it has different implications for different people. Think of that debate about uh, um, so, uh, subsidies for uh, gasoline prices. Yeah? 
SUV drivers will profit most. Well, poor people hardly drive an SUV. Um, the, all those processes of displacement, which we have experienced in the last couple of years, of extreme poverty popping up also in uh, European uh, countries. Um, the contrast of that extreme wealth exhibited by some people and uh, widespread precarious work or precarious life. Um, and the latest uh, report of uh, the, the, the latest world inequality report actually shows very uh, vividly in the numbers how in just three to four decades enormous uh, uh, changes in the distribution of wealth have happened. All those who um, may be object of othering experience that, so migrants, sick people, disabled people, unemployed people, to some extent one must, uh, if you think of these um, uh, hashtags, um, uh, Me Too, etc., the gender dimension also a part of the othering process. But at the same time, um, the dissolution of gender as a process that undermines the coherence of movements, for example, like the uh, women's movement. It disempowers these kind of movements if the underlying interest groups become more and more divided. Um, cultural disorientation, starting simply with Morse, which, for example, I uh, had a long thought about should I wear a, a, a suit or a jacket or should I just pop up in a t-shirt? Um, so 30 years ago it would be clear that I would wear a tie. Uh, but uh, this is just a, a, a funny aspect of uh, the underlying problem that uh, we are, all that individual freedom has a flip side, which means less orientation in what is appropriate in a particular situation. And, I mean, we uh, don't say anything new to you, uh, with the uh, popping up of fake news as an important element of public debate, we are less and less certain about what is true and what is not true. Um, so if you read in that literature about fractured society, these are the kind of things that they tell you are characteristic of fractured society. Oh yeah, there's an, one more group, uh, disconnected fatalism. So those groups that fall out of the whole uh, societal edifice, they, s they just move out. They don't try to get back into the society. So another element of fragmentation. Okay, so far the picture that is drawn by that literature. Let's put a question mark to the fractured society. It's not something very new. Lipset and Rotkin in the year when I was born um, had a, a wonderful paper uh, in which they describe cleavages of societies, and they argued that they are the fundament of the party systems uh, that have developed in different uh, Western educated industrial rich democracies. And they identify four divides, and whether a society is capable of building up homogeneity or not depends on whether these four cleavages intersect or whether they cross-cut. Now, if they cross-cut, then nothing happens. There are many small groups, pluralistic world uh, experiences, but if they are all cutting at the same um, divide, so if they overlap, then a society is at the risk of becoming fractured, one could say today. They didn't use that term. So, we can uh, derive from this argument actually two leading hypotheses 
On the one hand, we should expect a pluralism of life worlds and lifestyles, which overall ends up in a society that has some homogeneity in the sense of uh, no clear divides within the society. The contrasting hypothesis that has been uh, very popular and widespread in the last couple of years is a divide that has many different names. I uh, like most uh, to call it cosmopolitans against communitarians. So the cosmopolitans are those urban uh, freaks and flyers, uh, mostly with leftist orientation, um, mostly well-educated, uh, uh, well-endowed with money. And the communitarians are, well, the opposite. <laughs> and so what is described in more recent literature is a new divide, which is not a class divide, so not related to income or wealth, but it's related to worldviews, to lifestyles. Uh, and something I like very much, uh, my colleague Steph Stefan Mao uh, has argued uh, these two hypotheses are the dromedary versus camel uh, discussion or debate. The dromedary represents a more or less homogeneous society. So if you collapse all those uh, divides onto uh, one dimension, you get a nice hump in the middle. Well, the dromedary society would be one with two humps, a divided society. Now, Stefan Mao, his, his work as a keyword uh, to continue. He questions in a recent projects, um, which he has published in German only, um, uh, argues that, sure, it is about social structures, but we as sociologists should also be interested in mental maps. So what do people think? What are their perceptions? What are their cognitions? What are their attitudes? And he identifies four important divides. And if you look at it closely, then you see that it captures quite a bit of the, those arguments that have been put forward by the, uh, the proponents of fractured society. Um, and he analyzes these using all kinds of survey data, and nothing comes out. He simply doesn't find those divides. That's probably the reason why he's only published it in German, because there's no fancy thesis that you can prove with uh, data, and so it doesn't get into the English uh, language uh, journals. Anyway, that's my uh, suspicion. It may have different reasons. Um, okay. Now, let's do what Stefan Mao has done for mostly Germany, but also a couple of other countries. We've got those nice data, Austrian Corona panel. Um, it is Silvia Kritzinger, Hajo Baumgarten, Barbara Preinsack, and me. We, uh, we four are uh, leading that uh, project, and we have uh, developed that um, within two weeks after the first lockdown in Austria, which started on the 16th of March 2020. It was announced on the 13th, a weird day, day if you remember. Everybody was chasing water bottles and toilet paper. <laughs> and um, two weeks later, so the 13th, on the 27th, we fielded our first survey. That was made possible by the uh, Wiener Wir uh, Wissenschafts- und Technologiefonds and by the Rectorate of the University of Vienna. So we are very grateful to those organizations. And uh, it has developed since. So we are studying social, psychological, political, and economic consequences of the pandemic in the Austrian population. So it's about attitudes, it's about perceptions, feelings, behavior, information, Austrian population age 14 plus. It's an online panel study from March 2020 and the last wave was in May 22. And then we publicly announced 
we don't have any money left, which led to a funny reaction from politics. Oh, they don't have money left? Well, we can't do anything about it. Um, and it, it, there is a famous interview, uh, interview in the tip two, the, uh, the late evening uh, uh, daily news, where Armin Wolf asks the, uh, the Minister of uh, Education uh, why a few hundred thousand euros are not possible. Uh, and he said, well, he will look into it. Nobody has approached him yet. Now, we approached him after that interview. That's about a month ago. We didn't get any response yet. <laughs> Um, so, repeated observations, 32 waves, 1,500 res respondents per wave, and, um, well, there are some drop-offs that we have refilled, but almost everybody who was there in the first wave came back repeatedly. So what we have is data on individual people over more than two years during the pandemic, during different phases of the pandemic, so with some effort, because it's a very complex data set, with some effort, we can trace both societal developments and individual developments. So we will spend a couple of decades <laughs> uh, working on that data set, I'm afraid. Um, so no need to ask for further funding. <laughs> no, I'm joking. It's an interdisciplinary cooperation, so it's sociology, political science, um, uh, communication science. Uh, here is some information about the funding. Something we are very proud of is uh, we have set it up as an open science project and we were able to live that. Uh, the data are publicly available, so if you want to look into the data, please go ahead. Uh, all explanations are publicly available and our analyses are uh, on a project website which includes a blog with uh, about 150 um, short analyses of uh, different aspects of societal implications of the pandemic. Um, well, what I will present to you now in the next uh, section of my uh, presentation is some results that may say us something about the question whether we can describe Austria as a fragmented society or not. Um, the first topic that I briefly want to, sh to, uh, to go through with you um, is uh, a question that has been asked about, which can be related to social integration, uh, which goes like this, how much do you care about the living conditions of, and then it goes through Alfred Schütz's differentiation from the people in the immediate neighborhood until all people in the world. Uh, it has been asked in January 21, so the data are about one and a half years old. And what I did is I used this data to see whether I find any clusters in society. And now I give you the result of the cluster analysis. This is just to show off that I can draw nice pictures. Um, but what this tells us is that basically, uh, so there are two big groups, so that is a big divide between uh, groups of people, and then we have here somewhat smaller, and that then further differentiates into even smaller groups. I cut here, so I will look at four groups, and then let's have a look at how are these groups, uh, can we describe these groups in some way? Uh, do they capture some important difference in the societal structure? Now, on this graph, you find those groups termed one, two, three, and four, and these are the means, so the variable number, uh, values run from zero to five, and this bar represents the mean for that particular group, for that particular item in the questionnaire. So we have a group one, which asked, uh, were asked about people, care for people in the local neighborhood, and on average they are about three, so that's exactly in the middle of the distribution of that scale. And the, so it goes on till the world, and what you see, there's a slight decline uh, with ri uh, rising social distance. Yeah? Then group two, here we are at four out of five 
on average. And also you can see that slight decline with social distance. A uh, third group, which is below the average, the decline is somewhat less visible, but that's a statistical uh, um, um, uh, imprecision. And here we have a group that is even below one. Uh, one meaning actually not at all. Now let's, so this is what I just said. Uh, about two thirds of the respondents that there are those above that red dotted line care at least somewhat about others living in the neighborhood or in the rest of the world. And we see that there is considerable variation between cluster. Actually, that is what we like to produce if we do a cluster analysis. And little within cluster variation, that's what we like to find. So in that sense, statistically, we are fine with this result, but now we need to interpret what does this mean? Yeah? And now I have given them some characterization. Uh, the first group is but I would say indifferent people. They somewhat care about others. Now we have some people who are, seem to be socially responsible, who care about others. Then here group two is rather low, uh, careless people. But then we have here a group that is problematic, social, and I call them the sociopathic group. Now the distribution is two thirds are in that region that I would say that is, um, that is safe. Yeah, the, the, these are people that won't engage in disrupting society. They will care about their own business, perhaps, and not about others, but they won't actively work against society. These are, I would say, more egocentric. They, they use their elbows. And then this group here is the problematic group. Luckily, 4% is not a majority. So those, that, that group that is problematic, um, or that might be problematic um, in, in the sense from a social integrative perspective, is a very small group. It's not nothing, 4% of Austrians is still uh, four times 80,000, uh, so uh, about 300,000 people in Austria. It's not nothing, but still. Um, let's look at that differentiation within the, the, the uh, clusters. What you can see here is the distribution for the four groups for local, and then you can see the first group cares a lot about others, while the second group cares very much about others in the local environment. If we now move to the other side of the uh, scale uh, to the world, so other people in the world, then you can see that the distribution moves up to the region of not at all. Yeah? So they care less, in a statistically speaking, for people about the world. Well, it just gives you a more precise picture of what I just said. So care about others declines with social distance. That's something we can take along as a result. Now, if you want to explain or describe who is in which group, then things become problematic again. Because uh, what this picture tells you, this is a so-called multinomial logit model uh, using relative risks. Now, I won't uh, bore you with explaining exactly what it is, but it, uh, in loose terms, it tells you um, the difference in the probability of getting into that group or being clustered into that group given your profile on a set of variables. And the, the way it is set up is that we use the indifferent people, the group of indifference, as a reference group. And these dots represent the effect that is estimated as a difference from that reference group. And those lines describe the uncertainty, the statistical uncertainty, the so-called confidence interval. Now what we see is, and the, the red line is the line telling you there is nothing, there is no difference. So the relative risk ratio is one. And if it's one, then there's no difference. Now most lines cross that red line, which tells you, forget it, 
you won't get this, that published because nobody will believe you that there is an effect. There are small elements that are still interesting to look at. If you look at the gender, then there's no difference for, between the first and the second group, you know, the, up there uh, in, in our picture with the clusters. However, uh, they are less represented and considerably less represented in the more problematic groups, and particularly not uh, part of that uh, small extreme group. Uh, so gender uh, is a factor that is relevant. Education, yeah, in that problematic group, where is education? Here we have education. Um, no, they are not, uh, here. Uh, it, it's more likely that if you don't even have uh, the first level of secondary education finished, then you're more likely to be there. So it's the people who are in problematic life situations who are more likely to be in the group of radical isolation lists of sociopathic uh, perspectives. Income plays a role. People here tend, uh, have less income. Um, political orientation on the left-right um, are important. Where is it? Here. Uh, there was one where, I found, yeah, here. They are uh, left, uh, rightists are less likely in the group of people who are, um, um, who care a lot about others. Uh, so it's more leftist phenomenon. And uh, satisfaction with democracy has a very strong effect here uh, below uh, in that problematic group. Uh, so it, it still gives you an impression of who is in that uh, problematic group. It's small, but it's radical. And um, it consists of, um, well, age doesn't really have an effect, but of, uh, um, if you look at it in, in, in this way, um, but it, it's a male, badly educated issues of people who have, uh, um, who are at a distance of democratic thinking. Um, nevertheless, I have to emphasize, overall, uh, the effects are not big. So that's the take, uh, take home message. We find some differences, but uh, the big picture is uh, this is not fractured. So let's look at another dimension, societal values. And by societal values, we mean uh, importance of justice, of freedom, of democracy, of the rule of war, or law of solidarity, of security in society. So how do we think about how important is that? Yeah, so the importance of values in living together. Now again, a cluster analysis. In the meantime, you know what I do here. Uh, I cut here, I produce five groups. And uh, let's look at those groups. Now we find that 80% of all people fall into that group two. And what is uh, specific about that group two it distributes 100 points to be distributed over six different values almost equally. Yeah, the variation here, forget about that, that's statistical uncertainty. Um, so about 20% of 100% to each of those, no, not 20%, sorry, uh, one sixth <laughs> uh, to each of uh, those uh, six criteria. But then there are small groups. Yeah, we have one group of about 4.5% who value security very highly. So people who think the most important thing in, in, in society is, is, is security. So the police should be there. <laughs> then there we have a group, justice is extremely important. It's small at 3%, but um, uh, uh, they care very much. And then there's a group who thinks freedom is very important, 5%. Now, I wonder who this is. The group is so small that it's very difficult to get at it with statistical means. And I have two hypotheses, or I, I think that there are two groups behind that. On the one hand, it's those people, think about March 22, who don't want to wear any masks, uh, thank you, uh, who uh, don't want to uh, get vaccinated, et cetera, et cetera. So it's part of them. 
But another part, I believe, they uh, think at a more fundamental level of uh, that a society that is not free is not worth a society. And, and th that's the problematic aspect also in that whole debate because uh, freedom is such a difficult element. So what we can conclude from this analysis is that most people are fine with the way our uh, democratic rule of law, cohesive solidarity system or society uh, works. And then there are some that have specific interests. But this is not a picture of a fractured society. Here, let's have a different view, uh, a more dynamic view. Um, these are uh, pictures that have become uh, famous because they have also been broadcasters over uh, uh, the media. Um, we have a set of uh, items that ask about uh, the perception of uh, social solidarity. And I read out the, the items. We are all doing our best to overcome the crisis situation the second one is most agree that cohesion is important in the current crisis situation. And the third one, in the current situation, we are moving together to protect the weak. Now, in uh, about uh, Easter 2020, uh, you can see that the blue part is the largest part of a bar. Yeah, so week three of the pandemic, of the, lo of the lockout, people stick together. But and very quickly, that feeling, that perception of uh, race solidarity dwindles. And then it remains at that low level for the rest of the pandemic, which seems to be the normal. Unfortunately, we don't have data going back to before the pandemic, so we can't make that comparison. But it seems like that first lockdown was a very specific situation, and I think everybody here in the room can tell stories about the particularities of those weeks. So, there is no, nothing special, apparently, about the perception of solidarity nowadays. Okay, there's one aspect that I would like to uh, emphasize before closing. And that is that aspect of local solidarity. So the previous slide was about general solidarity within the population. But what about neighborhood? And um, luckily, uh, a couple of colleagues have done an analysis and published it in the, uh, one of our blogs. Uh, here you can see, and this is the important one, during the pandemic, and this was in May 2020, the blue one, and the orange one was in November 2020, uh, you can see that about half of the people have engaged in some sort of neighborly hel uh, uh, help. Well, 50% of the population, that's substantial. However, if you sum rarely and once, that uh, then about uh, 50 to 60 percent of those 50 percent did so once or now and then. So not really uh, something specific, but perhaps they went shopping for an elderly neighbor or something like that. And now several times per month or several times per week is a substantial minority, but it's substantial. I mean, still about 40% of uh, people, well, of half, so it's 20% of the whole population who engaged. That's, that's something. It's not overwhelming, but there's some sort of solidarity uh, at the local level that exists. Okay, most do so only rarely. Let me wrap up um, and try to interpret what we have observed. At least at the level of perceptions in the population, well, what uh, philosophers and social scientists uh, see may be something different, but ordinary people whom you ask on the street rarely will perceive severe disruption of societal cohesion. No fractures visible, at least not in our data, and not in the way we measured it. 
Um, we find that the large majority of people exhibit moderately pro-social attitudes, yeah, moderately, and they support fundamental societal values. However, one can also sense, and I haven't elaborated that very extensively here, that people have concern about solidarity in the society. Yeah? So it's an issue. It's not there, but it's a potential that might happen that people are afraid of. We don't find homogeneity, but we also don't find fragmentation or antagonism. And in that, uh, the analysis for Austria uh, just uh, echoes what Stefan Mao has found in Germany and other European countries. What we do find is to stay in the same uh, imagery of fractures, what we see is splinters of radicals. Well, um, when I uh, took my bicycle home to come here earlier today, um, the bicycle road on the Wiener Ring was blocked by a demonstration with a big transparent in front uh, of, we want to get rid of Van der Bellen and a couple of other politicians' names. And what they, what they sang was um, that peace song by John Lennon. And what I felt was these people are using something which has a completely different content for uh, a goal that is disruption of society. So they turn it into, its, uh, in, in, into the other side. So there are those people, and we, f we see them. It's those 4% who have uh, uh, gone away in our uh, data. They are extremely loud and aggressive. And they get, they receive excessive attention by political action actors and by the media, which makes them seem larger than they actually are. And at the same time, the, there's insufficient attention by authorities. I just think of that doctor. I don't get her name now. Kellermeyer, who was driven into suicide by a mob of people, and she was not protected by the, the authorities. And uh, I, I simply want to uh, mention her in this talk because she is so, uh, it, 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 well, I don't have words for that. Um, and so I think the problem that we are observing at the moment is not a problem of a fractured society. It's a problem of a group of people, a small group of people, who have des has decided to be against everything. And because they're loud, because they make very well use of all the communication ch channels that are available nowadays, they get more attention by uh, um, in the public debate and the public uh, opinion than they actually are worth. Let me stop at that point and thank you for your attention. <laughs>